So comprehension. Now, this is from the Rand Reading Research Study Group. And they define comprehension as the intersection between the reader, the text, the activity, and all of that was in a much larger socio-cultural bubble. This idea that comprehending takes three things. Differences and is affected by three things. Differences in the reader, difference in the text, and then differences in the activities that you're doing with those that meaning making process. However, I think by now you've all heard about the Common Core State Standards. You might also be familiar with this concept that they talk a lot about close reading and text-dependent questions. I've talked about it all semester long. So in that kind of viewpoint, comprehension relies more heavily on differences in the text. And they're putting a much larger emphasis on the role of the text in comprehension. So, you know, we're getting, you know, we're getting away from a lot of the reader response theories, um, a lot of the role of just, uh, no, I don't want to say we're getting away from prior knowledge, but the idea that we should be teaching just coverage and strategy instruction. Um, instead, it's the idea that we should be focusing mainly on teaching students how to withdraw meaning from text. It's really the theoretical underpinning of a lot of the comprehension in the Common Core State Standards. So, for example, they organize their ideas first around key ideas and details. Look at these words. Read closely to determine what the text says explicitly. Then you're making inferences from that information. You're not doing, t you don't, do you see text-to-text -text connections or text-to-self connections? No, it's, they're, they're taking kind of the reader and your experience out of it and making the text most suspended. So you're citing specific textual examples. You might be determining the central ideas or themes of a text, summarizing key supporting details and ideas. There's no feelings involved in this kind of reading. We don't care what you, your interpretation. We just want to know what it says. That was a little bit of sarcasm, but um, analyze how and why individuals shape ideas or interact over the course of a text. So you're, you're, you're basically interacting with the words and the author, not your reactions. The craft and structure. So not the key ideas, but how does the author shape the words and the ideas that she is using? I can't be gender nonspecific with putting she in and getting called out. Here I am trying to address gender equality in my classroom, and I get called out. Whether she or he put into the text. Interpret words or phrases that they are that as they are used in the text. So how now you're looking at word choice. Remember we talked about academic vocabulary? Analyze text structures. There's very specific forms of text, the compare and contrast text, the, um, you know, chronological text. And we're going to talk about text structure. And then assess how point of view shapes the content and style of the text, evaluative. So we're going from kind of that first one's like literal. And now you see that we're really evaluating down here. Then the final section of the anchor standards involved reading is, well, not the final, because there's also the text complexity, but what I'm focusing on today is the integration of knowledge and ideas. And this is more about multiple source reading with comprehension. Also using digital media, looking at, you know, diverse media. But look, now delineate, evaluate arguments and claims in the text. Analyze how two or more texts, see, so we're talking about multiple sources. This is going to be a big push in elementary schools when you folks get jobs. Doing multiple source reading is not something that we do a lot in elementary schools. It's going to increase dramatically. So we need to be prepared with methods 
for multiple source reading comprehension. And we talk about three levels of comprehension. Literal, interpretive, and evaluative. The literal is our text base. What is actually said by the author, what does he, is that better, say in the text? And then, or what did she imply? What can you infer? Now the evaluative, that's kind of, now you're you know, thinking maybe about the point of view and thinking about how does that influence what is said? Maybe putting it within the historical context and time period of the text. But you really can't have that kind of value without that being able to infer from the text, and you can't really infer without that literal understanding. So it always is driven back, under this worldview, it's always driven back to the concept of what was actually stated in the text. So, how do we, what's the best method for building comprehension? And we're going to focus in on text differences, text-based analysis, and text-based talk. And today I'm going to share with you multiple methods to do both. You have to have high-quality talk around text and high quality manipulation of text in your classroom. And I will share strategies to do this in the pre-K classroom all the way up through high school. Well, we talked about text structure. Okay. The first, you really want to have explicit instruction in text structure. And there are specific kinds of text. When talking through informational text, good readers focus in on text structure. It is the key to understanding what the message the author is trying to entail. It also gives you ideas about how you can create launch questions to ask your peers. Text structures refer to the internal organization of a text. As authors communicate or write an idea, they use a predictable text structure to communicate with the audience. This allows them to okay. really get across the point in their point of I view. I promise you that I fixed that spelling mistake on the actual explain everything on my computer. But for some reason, every time I upload it to YouTube, it goes right back to that. But that's good because we talked about um, the differences between homophones and homographs the other day. So this is really a strategic error on my part. I, but I promise you, if I pull out my iPad, it does, it says t, does not say T-H-E-R-E. -E. It says T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E. I know, I was hoping some, I'm glad somebody caught that that would still be wrong. But I don't know why something goes, it's a glitch. Every time I upload the video, it's not. So I think I had to delete the video instead of editing the video. Text structures are key things to hone in on for good reasons. So these are like, this is an example of they mini the main idea, I created for seventh graders on text structures. The supporting details that illustrate that main idea, and these details are connected by, by transition words. That link all of the text structures together. And this is something I mean. So, as a good reader, if you can analyze text structure, you can figure out what an author is trying to say and what the key ideas are. So, here's their types. When reading informational texts, your first goal as a reader is to identify the type of text structure. There are some common text structures there is the chronological text structure, which details a piece in order of events, a cause and effect text structure, which describes a cause and effect, one event leading to another, a problem and solution text structure, which presents an issue and the way that issue can then be solved, a compare and contrast text structure, 
which looks at the similarities and differences between two topics, and a description text structure, which describes the who, what, why, when, and how of an event. It is the basic expository text structure. Each of these text structures has their own unique way of being formed and utilize specific transition words. In later tutorials, we will describe so each and every channel, one. I go over each one, of those. I don't have time. Once you have identified um, the text structure the author used to organize right the piece, now. your next okay, step is there? to find the main idea. There are two types of main idea. An explicit main idea and an implicit main idea. An explicit main idea is stated out in the open. An implicit main idea has to be inferred from the details the author gave you. And to infer means to draw a conclusion from the details provided by the author. Let's give it a try. In this example, there is an explicit main idea. Let's read so the paragraph. Is the kind of teaching that there is a problem with security in the garage. Radios have been stolen from four cars in our parking garage this month. Each time that these have managed to get by the parking garage security with radios in hand, even though they do not have a parking garage identification card, which people must show as they enter and exit the garage. Here the first sentence explicitly states the main idea. There is a problem with security in the garage. The other details provide evidence to prove this point. It is an explicit main idea. In this next example, we have an implicit main idea. Once again, that means you must infer or draw a conclusion from the information that is given to discover the main idea. So let's read this paragraph. Radios have been stolen from four cars in our parking garage this month. Each time the thieves have managed to get by the parking garage security with radios in hand, even though they do not have a parking garage identification card, which people must show as they enter and exit the garage. Yet each time the security officers say they have seen nothing unusual. In our last example, it clearly stated that there was a problem That's with traffic. security in the garage. In this example, you have to infer that from the information as given. What clues do we have? Well, first, radios have been stolen. And the part and the thieves managed to get in the garage without the garage identification card. And finally, the security officers have seen nothing unusual. Those three points lead us to the conclusion that there is a problem with security in the garage. And now, th the next step I did is I would have once the, again text structure is the students work on another example together for their guided practice, or with me as a guided practice. That was my mom. Then they had another one on implicit and explicit main ideas they did for um, independent practice, and that's how I'm basically focused on teaching those identifying key ideas. Um, and that's a perfect little mini lesson that, you know, like five minutes of direct instruction. So don't think that, like, I hope you leave my class with this idea that direct instruction is not a bad word. It's a very good word, especially in, in reading instruction. And it's not that I'm not talking about 40 minute lectures to a bunch of three year old um, third graders. You know, little bits of five to seven minute instructions as needed when you, when you notice that your students need help with something. Um, and teaching them text structure is quite important. So if you want to see the other examples, um, they are all available on my YouTube channel. So what are some methods for text-based discussions? Um, we've done, like, for example, and we'll go through a little bit more of these. Reciprocal teaching, literature circles, online discussions, accountable talk. Um, these are all methods, when, if you do your text-based analysis, that you can really focus in on building. You want kids talking about the text. But you want that conversation driven by the text. Um, I'm not going to really go through lit circles and reciprocal teaching because you all have pretty much had me for 301 and 318. I mean, sorry. 
either 307 or 308, and we talk about these methods in that class in great detail. Um, but I want you to just get a little taste of some of the ideas that are out there. So, but teaching comprehension, what do we know? Well, the National Reading Panel, you know, and we go back to those five elements of reading that we basically designed our entire class around, identified a few things. First, when you teach strategy instruction, it does lead to improvement in comprehension. However, like I've said before, that strategy instruction has a, the, the effect of that strategy instruction is much greater for students who are struggling readers. It's, you know, strategy instruction for your high performing readers is often a waste of time. Why? They already do it. Yeah, they already do it. It's what good readers do. They're already good readers. So we have to think about ways of extending their comprehension by building up their content knowledge in other subjects, by encouraging independent reading, or by encouraging high-level talk. Um, strategies work when they're taught in an active and naturalistic learning situation. You don't just say, oh, we're just going to do summarizing today. And, you know, it's all we're going to do. It's best when taught within the content. The content equals comprehension. So you want to, you know, for too long we've kind of let, in the, the realm of trying to improve reading scores, we've cut back on our science and social studies, which guess what? We're not building up content knowledge. When you're not building up content knowledge, you're hurting comprehension. So it's like a double-edged sword. By trying to fix the reading problem, we may have technically made it worse, because we did not build up the content knowledge in our students. Teachers can be taught how to be effective teachers with comprehension. However, you need extensive teacher preparation. Um, this one lecture, not enough. That's why I'm very happy that we've taken this class and divided it into two. Uh, because I could spend you know, a few weeks on comprehension instruction. And we'll be able to once it's K through this class is organized K3 and 3-6. But what are some methods for teaching comprehension um, recognized by the National Reading Report? These, granted, remember the goal is always text based analysis and text based um, discussion. Well, you can focus on comprehension monitoring, which is basically a metacognitive understanding of what the heck did that just say? That's a, that's a technical term. Um, cooperative learning methods such as reciprocal teaching, using graphic and semantic organizers. Teaching your students about story structure, which I think I kind of um, taught you a lot about in 307 and 308. You spent a lot of time analyzing story structure. Um, doing different question and answering techniques. Um, having students generate their own questions. Teaching students to summarize. And providing strategy instruction in multiple reading comprehension strategies. All of these are recognized as research-based practices that improve meaning-making in students. So, with comprehension monitoring, you want students to be able to know when they're understanding, when they don't understand. It's their duh moments and their aha moments. And when they have a moment, you want them to have the ability to go back and reread or apply some fix it strategies. You folks remember we might have watched a podcast last year in 307 about the kids talking about the fix it strategies that they used. So good readers do things. They ask questions like, does this really make sense? Hmm. Do I have any idea what I'm reading right now? 
did I remember to turn off the oven before it? No, if they don't ask that, that would mean they're off topic. But they might recognize when they get off topic. And they use fix-it strategies, such as rereading a text, or thinking aloud about a text, or summarizing by restating what they read to themselves. All of these help them identify the difficulty that they are having. So encouraging your students to use fix-it strategies, which is another way of saying comprehension monitoring. Do you understand the words that are on this page? It's an effective way to build comprehension skills. And for anyone that's teaching their comprehension mini lesson over the next two class sessions, anything that I'm covering today are all ideas that you and your partner may use. You can do your comprehension monitoring at the sentence level, the paragraph level, and the page level. And you need to teach your students those differences. How do you check yourself at the sentence level? Once you get down to a page or a paragraph, do you, can you identify that main idea? At the page level, what do you remember? Can you recall some details? These are all methods. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, Molly. Just let me know if I go too. You know, um, let me know if oh, I forgot where I was going. Oh, if I get the page level, what do I recall when I'm reading? And these are all provide the reader with opportunities to monitor their comprehension. And this is something that needs to be explicitly modeled and taught at every grade level. You can do this in preschool, where you ask them, who remembers what just happened on the last page? Um, you can do this in high school, obviously, because it's, tell me what just happened on the last page. It's something that is just, we know that this is an effective means to improving comprehension. Uh, cooperative learning. Techniques such as reciprocal teaching or literature circles. Like I said, I think I've covered those enough. I spent, we spent a semester on these kinds of techniques last year. Um, so I'm not going to really delve into them deeply now. But we know that reciprocal teaching is a what, you know, it focuses on four specific strategies. Question, clarify, summarize. What am I missing? Told, predict. Question, clarify, summarize, and predict. Um, literature circles, we used to start off with these roll sheets where everybody had a specific strategy they were working on. We're kind of getting away from that now um, and just trying to embed more authentic text-based discussions versus assigning specific roles in our literature circles. Graphic organizers, a very effective way to scaffold comprehension. So here's kind of a story map. Title of the author, a main character, setting, supporting characters, what was the problem, what was the solution. So you're having students, what are they basically doing? They're recalling events. But you're organizing um, story structure for them. You're requiring them to summarize key details. So we know that the use of graphic organizers is a research-based way to improve reading comprehension. It is not a worksheet. Okay? It is a scaffold that you use with your students to help model and teach different skills. If you're just giving it as a homework assignment, you're just giving it a worksheet. Here's an example of a character chart. Um, and on my blog, I have a lot of examples for these for either just that you can download or as, um, if you're in an iPad classroom, I make a lot of 
interactive graphic organizers for iPads. Um, so in this one, it's the name of the book, what was the character's name, and the head, like, usually you can have a thought bottle. Thought bottle? Not a bottle head, but a, a, yes, a thought bubble. Uh, maybe a thought bubble saying, maybe you're doing it on character traits. And what about what did this character say that reveals about who they are with their arms? What did, this, or what did the character do? Uh, where did the character go? How in the heart does, does it, do you have any, did he express any feelings that reveal something about his character? So you can use graphic organizer to help support your understanding of text. The Venn diagram, another way to like focus in on text structure. We use all the time when we're talking about compare and contrast text. Cats, dogs, the same. You know, both animals, dumb, awesome. Cats, dogs, same. So we can, you know, you can use those kinds of things to talk about text. Uh, story structure. When you're, you know, when you are, we do use a lot of narrative, especially in the younger grades, to teach comprehension. And you need to focus in on, I mean, folks, ask yourself if you need to write this down. You may not need to. Um, you probably know that a story has title, character, settings, climax, um, rising action, and resolutions, problems, and solutions. But you do want to explicitly teach those details. In 307, and I, I've been having my um, hybrid 307 class actually make little YouTube clips to teach each one of these like elements. We're having a lot of fun with that. Comprehension strategy instruction. You guys have seen me draw this on the board all the time, the kind of the gradual release of responsibility graphic, where you have your teacher responsibility, your student responsibility. Up here, over on the left, you're talking about a lot of explicit instruction and modeling. In the middle here, that's your like, teaching zone, guided practice, and your independent practice. But you want to focus in on what do good readers do. I know it beat you that over the head, you know, you want to frame your classroom. Well, we're all good readers, and what are good readers? Well, we make predictions. But you don't want to just have kids predict for prediction's sake. It has to be the point where it makes sense or helps un their understanding. But these are, like, some of the comprehension strategies that I like focusing in on. Predicting, clarifying, questioning, visualizing, self-correcting, summarizing, and analyzing cause and effect. There's more, but these are kind of the ones that I choose to focus in on. And again, you do that, how do you do it? The same thing I tell you, you explicitly define, you model, guided practice, and independent practice. But it has to, it cannot be decontextualized. Strategy instruction can't be decontextualized. If the kids are just reading a book and predicting just for predicting sake, you have to contextualize it in the content that you're teaching. So summarizing, we know that teaching summarizing is an effective way to improve, to improve reading comprehension. And what are the steps that I use with my students? Well, I first ask them to identify the big idea. You know? Then what are the main ideas that support that big idea? I want them to remove extra information, erroneous details. Then reread their summary and revise it if it doesn't make sense.
And there's, there's, you know, there's ultimate, there's tons of ways to teach summarizations. So you could do a whole, you could do your mini lesson on that. Like you do the gist statements. You could do, there's lots of different ways you could do mini lessons on summarizations. You do mini lessons. So if you wanted to do a, um, if you're looking for a comprehension mini lesson to do, you can take any one of those comprehension skills that I just did and give us a, a mini lesson on one of those specific comprehension skills. There's another idea that you can do for your project. So, questioning. Your goal as a teacher is to increase the complexity and the sophistication of the questions that you're asking your students. You want them to be able to understand what I call the difference between thick and thin questions, open-ended kind of close-ended questions, and be able to answer those simple, those complex and simple questions. And they need to know how to approach different questions. Like, Go through and well, what is this question asking you? What are the key details? How how is this question different from another question? And you do this by encouraging students to ask their own types of questions. Um, and asking, learning how to do effective questioning, that's tough. I mean, I, I will say that it's going to be, as a new teacher, it's going to be something you're going to spend a lot of time learning to do. And I'm going to take some time next session after the first batch of people present, and we're going to go over different kinds of questioning techniques that you can use in your classroom. Um, there's uh, some of the ones that I like, questioning the author, there's, you know, um, QAR, there's a whole bunch of different methods and, and we'll describe them a little bit in the next classroom session. It's not something I can do in just a couple minutes. So, but what does this look like in an early childhood classroom? I like using an approach called um, dialogue reading. And basically asking simple questions and then following them up with expanded questions. So you kind of give them an easy entry point. And this is really a method used in preschools and, and like kindergarten, first grade. Um, and then you, but the, the, the concept behind it would work anywhere. So, but to get it to work, again, this is nothing new that I haven't been beating the drum all semester long. You're going to need a language-rich classroom environment, right? You need to have time for reading every day in your early childhood classroom, um, and you should have a kind of a cozy, cute space to read, right? It's nothing I haven't been talking to you for since last year about in 308 and now in 318, or 307 and now 301. So again, it's about that language-rich environment, uh, making time every day for reading, and creating a comfortable spot for reading in your early childhood classroom. And there's two ways that you can remember them. And the first is peer. You want to prompt students to say something about the book. Then you evaluate that response, providing evidence for correction. You, as a teacher, extend the response. You're going to add information. We are talking about four and five year olds. They're not the authority in the classroom. Then you repeat what the student said and you review what is read. 
They're also not doing the reading, so it's their major interaction with the text is through this dialogic questioning techniques. Now, how do you write a prompt, though? What's, we use some of the method to come up with it. Like, peers is the way that you use them, but how do you come up with them? I use the acronym CROWD. Oh, well, somebody else came up with it. I cannot take credit for this at all. You have a CROWD prompt, where you leave a blank for the child to fill in. Recall prompts, what has already been read. So the CROWD prompts, you give them a blank. Like a close, it's um, the close prompt. You know, like kind of a... Then you give them a recall prompt where you ask them to tell us, remind us what's been read. Open ended by th those kind of focusing on the pictures. What do you guys think is happening in this picture? Tell me what's over here. The, the you know, your five W prompts. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then the distancing prompts where you ask them to bring it back to their own life. I mean, and you can you can use this this crowd idea to come up with questions at almost any grade level. You just would you put the on the open ended. You take the focus away from the pictures and more be on like the characters or the themes of a story. It's called the seahorse. See how he's restating and asking for informa more information? I wonder how many things the shark's going to eat. I wonder how many that is. He can eat 11 things so he can get bigger. That airplane can go in the water? I thought airplanes went in the sky. How do you know it can go in the water? 
That airplane starts in the water? No. Um, the other airplanes have wings. On walkways, not on water. It's, you got to love watching kids read. The video uh, that I'm going to do today is on dialogic reading. I'm going to read the book Machines at Work by Byron Barton. And this is Braxton. He is going to be my helper today. You ready, Braxton? Yeah. Okay. Machines at Work. What kind of machines do you think we're going to see in this book? Make a prediction it's question there. It's a in a robot. I think we're going to see all of those in this book. That's very exciting. Hey. Hey, guys. Hey, you guys. Let's get to work. All right. The next page said, let's get to work. So they're off to work, and they're getting on their different machines. Knock down that building. All right. They use the wrecking ball. Why are they going to knock down that building? Because they're going to build a new building. You're right. They're going to build a new building right there. Can't wait to see what it's going to look like. Who knows that? That tree. That tree. Oh. Think he's read the book before? So connecting something to his life. What, Robert? 